racism. Now, if I don't say anything else, I've already said a mouthful. I want you to do this for me, everybody. Yes, it looks like the sign for our TED Talk. <laughs> but it also is an invitation. And can I have a conversation with you in this space? And by doing this, you invite me into your space, and I invite you into mine. Thank you. I am born in the church. I've been a minister for 33 years. I have been a pastor for 20 years, an ordained elder for 21 years. I'm a fourth generation Church of God in Christ. My presiding bishop is Bishop J. Drew Sheard. My jurisdictional bishop is Bishop Fred Washington. I come from a lineage of preachers and teachers and singers and elders and pastors. But I'm also a software engineer. I'm a graduate of St. Cloud State University with a bachelor's degree in computer science. And I've got 20 years working in the corporate world as a software application developer. I've got 10 kids. <laughs> seven boys, three girls, seven grandchildren. And my wife, Natoya, and I love them all. I tell you these things to perhaps pr provide you with a little bit of context about this conversation that I would like to have with you. You see, racism is older than this country. It has existed for so long, and yet we have been unable to eradicate it from our society, from our social norms. And why is that? Is it because it's too big for us to deal with? Is it because we are unable, or incapable, it's not possible? I've wrestled with this for a long time. When I think about what racism entails and how we are going to be able to deal with it, it makes me go to my computer science background where we deal with big problems all the time. And the way that we deal with big problems in computer science is we break it down. We, break, we take the big problem, we break it down to a, a couple of different smaller problems. And then we take that and we break it down even further. And we get down to a point where we can uh, get to a bite-sized problem that we can actually work on and solve. And then we add instruction to it, and then we put it back together again, problem with solution. And then we put that back together again, problem with more solution, until we get all the way back up. It's like building a car with zeros and ones. When my girls were younger, my oldest girl, she was four years old, and we were riding in a car together. And when uh, we were in the car, it was just me and her, and we were uh, going somewhere, and in that car, in that time, at that, in that space, she looked at me and she said, Daddy, what color am I? A perplexing question coming from the most innocent of places. That's, that's a good one, daughter. <laughs> but the thing that was most interesting is that five years later, my youngest daughter, same age, same situation, in the car, me and her going somewhere, I don't remember where, turns to me and asks me, Daddy, what color am I? Now, despite the difficulty of the problem that exists and the question that is in there, my engineering mind begins to come at me and say, there's a pattern here that at this place, at this age, in this space, with me, 
It's okay to ask this question and expect an answer. In this space, at this age, with me, it's okay to ask this question and expect an answer. Now, I won't describe to you the horrors of discrete math, and I won't get into that or what I would normally call the math with no numbers. But I would, what I will tell you is that this was a problem that needed to be solved, a statement that needed to be proven. Now, racism is an ugly thing. And it is so pervasive, so disgusting, so vile, that is a kind of hate that has its own name, racism. And what are we to do with that? What is our reaction to that? In the last several years, we've experienced the height of the extreme of racism, and we've been uh, un unfortunate enough to see the expression of that racism on our screens, whether it be in our hands or on TV the killing of George Floyd, and so many other things that was happening. And so for us, in my community, here in this space, in the wake of the Chauvin trial, another killing, Dante Wright, in the wake of that killing, our community came to a place where we wanted to answer this question, what do we do? How do we come to this place? Are we going to have another summer of Violence, are we going to have another summer of protest? What do we do? And we asked ourselves and we asked each other, what do we do? I asked myself, what do I do? And I took the opportunity to be able to pause, pray, reflect. And I wrote an app. If you're one of those people that have your phones in your hands right now, you can go to this place right now from your phone. And this is an application that I have written called Safe Spaces. Safe Spaces is an application that is built as a tool to a community-wide effort to develop relationships around hard conversations. Going here is a guide, several guides as a matter of fact, both for small groups as well as for individuals because when we study society and we look at the large problem, because racism is all of our problem, but when we break that down, we get to small groups and when we break that down even further, we get to the individuals. And it's at that individual level that we really begin to take the opportunity to be able to learn what is really going on inside of us. What is it that's feeding racism? What is it that is making racism stay alive? In some regards, it's ignorance. Ignorance of ourselves, ignorance of another person or group. In some regards, it is just a, a, a stain. It's just that, a hatred. But it's hard to hate somebody that you know. And so if we take the opportunity to be able to get together and have these conversations, we come to the place where we realize that it is not as pervasive as we think it is. In my faith tradition, Jesus was the kind of person that would have a conversation with everybody. And that was also to the, dis the dismay of those people that were around him. Why are you talking to her? Why are you talking to him? And Jesus would oftentimes never bring any condemnation to the person that he was having a conversation with. And so when we think about the way that we are to be able to interact with one another, we must take this into consideration that maybe perhaps there's a thing that we must do. And this is that balance between faith and logic. See, it makes sense for us not to hate each other. That makes sense. That's logical. And there are a lot of things in this world that make sense and that are logical, but there are a lot of things that are not. Like, for example, why my son likes to put holes into walls. <laughs> why did you punch a hole in the wall? I don't know. Why my daughters pick these 
fellows. <laughs> what you pick him for? I don't know. I love him. But where logic fails, faith presides. And all of a sudden, we begin to have an understanding of things that don't make sense, but we can still see it. Let us use for our definition of faith that it is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And all of a sudden, what we can do is we can begin to see reason that the reason why my son put his hands through that wall is because he believed that he could do it. Or the reason why my daughter likes this guy is because of what she can see in him and not what he's currently presenting to me now. <laughs> Faith gives us another, an opportunity to be able to extend past our borders of understanding. And it allows us to get to a place where we can get to a different level of understanding outside of our preconceived notions. See, you have to understand that it is these preconceived notions and these stereotypes that is at the bedrock of any racist situation, no matter what side of that conversation you end up on. And so when we come to this conversation, we must make sure that we understand that really what we need to do is come at best with a hypothesis that we have an idea about what it is that we want to do but, or, or what we want to come to a conclusion about, but that we must do the analysis that says, what is the truth? Tell me why you believe that way. Why is it that you have that understanding and why do you feel that way? It is in us doing that analysis that we are able to take back the information and then form a report. This scientific method is the way that humanity has been able to achieve the greatness that we have right now. We have in our pockets, in our hands, more technology than we went to the moon with. And yet, we can't seem to figure out a way to get around something so vile and so ugly and so disgusting as racism. But we can try by inviting each other into a safe space. The idea behind safe space, and this is a community-wide initiative that I have led with our community here to be able to say that we won't bring any conditions to the conversation. This works off of a term called unconditional positive regard. Inside of that, what that means is, is that when I come to this conversation, what I say will not be judged and what I hear will not be criticized. And by bringing that into the conversation, you can say what you want to say. And I can hear what I need to hear. And there's no judgment in that. And in this way, we give an opportunity for us to be able to grow. I don't need to convince you of my side, and you don't need to convince me of yours, but understanding why you're there is at the hallmark of what we're doing. Safe spaces is an opportunity to be able to do that. Now, here is my ask. I would like for you to contribute to this initiative to have a safe space conversation. I would like for you not only to have a safe space conversation, but I want you to commit to having two safe space conversations for the next 12 months. Yeah, I know, 12 months. But here's the deal. We should not have to wait for another travesty to happen before we do something about it. And so let's take the opportunity to learn about each other while we have the peace and the time to be able to do it. If you would take that time to have those two conversations and log them into this application, 
We can have 5,000 of these conversations on top of the hundreds that we have already had inside of this 12 months. And you and I, we can unravel this racism that seems to be so pervasive that we can't, we can't hit it from the top, but from the bottom, from the inside of you and me, on the individual level, at the places where you and I can develop a personal understanding, we can deal with racism right where it lives in the heart. My dream is that racism is pulled at the coattail, and we unravel it such that it begins to create an entire movement that we can move the needle on this conversation and reveal the yet-to-be-discovered society where we love one another. You have safe space conversations all the time. You just need to take credit for it. Safe Spaces has three questions that it asks. Are you in a safe space? Am I in a safe space? And are we ready to have an uncomfortable conversation? If the answer is yes, then we can proceed. When we have that conversation, and when we're done, we've grown, despite where it's gone. My dream is that we get to the place where your conversation can end like mine did with my daughters. Because each time my daughters ask me, what color am I, daddy? My response to them is that they were beautiful. Thank you.